Good morning. Hello. Welcome. This is Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, Making Cyberpunk Games for Today. How do we make relevant cyberpunk social sci-fi? How to avoid pitfalls like neon orientalism and ableist metaphors, a brief history of the cyberpunk genre, and how to shift the narrative back to radical social sci-fi. So um, we are waiting for one more person. We're having some technical issues, but hopefully Etten will join us. Um, I am Kira. I'll be moderating and also saying things. Um, uh, my, I have no pronouns. I am a queer, non-binary game designer in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and my favorite thing about cyberpunk is cyborgs, I think. Um, can everyone, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves briefly and say, your, say one of your favorite things about the cyberpunk genre. Oh no, I gotta think about that. I know it's hard. I love so many things. I'm going last. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going yeah, last. I, I, go I, ahead. I, I, I could go next. I, 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 I sacrifice myself. Hello, my name is Jamie. My pronouns are he, they. I endeavor to be one of the many himbos of the TTRPG space here to support you in the most queer chiller way possible. Uh, yeah, and what I love about cyberpunk is that blending of you know, when an AI asks a question of like, do I have a soul? Like that stuff always gives me like the shivers that is really just like mm, the good stuff, right? So uh, that's why a lot of my cyberpunk games feature uh, machines and AI as like main characters, right? Cause I, I just love that so much. So like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I will go next, I guess. Uh, hi, I'm Kenna, my friend of the she and they. I'm a TTRPG designer, streamer, all around internet person, uh, including a uh, co-creator of the TTRPG Safe Toolkit. Um, I am also a big cyberpunk nerd though. I, I did a big cyberpunk project this year. So uh, that's been my 2021. Um, but my favorite thing about cyberpunk, uh, other than the AI stuff, which Jeremy like hit on the head for me as well, um, is, uh, people banding together uh, to fight the corporations and capitalism because yes, we need screw so capitalism. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a nice fantasy sometimes to be like, yes, I am here to say screw capitalism and to, to, to screw up some corporations and stuff. It's very, yeah. very satisfying to take down megacorps when you're just like this little, little robot person, you know, in effect. I always support that, um, which leaves me kind of. Hello, uh, I'm B. My pronouns are they, them. Um, podcaster, streamer, sometimes writer, uh, community manager for Adventures League. Honestly, I just want to be a robot. Uh, so I love so that. <laughs> right, though? I really I just, want that. Strong non binary cyborg. vibes. Yes. Please. Let yes. me be a robot. Anyways, sorry, go ahead. It's good. No, cyborg is like the best I could ever get, but it, like even like becoming a cyborg, like you're just introduced to so many upgrades. And that's what I really want, not only in my real life, but in my fantasy life and just forever. Because like accessibility, the, the options, I could get a cannon blaster for an arm. Who needs actual hands when you could have a cannon blaster? Um, therefore, that's my favorite in cyberpunk. <laughs> I think cannon arm is one of my favorite cyberpunk tropes. <laughs> it's good. Your arm just unfolds and it's something else. And it's a um, weapon. Yeah. <laughs> here for it. Uh, Etten, are you here? Can you hear us? Hey! Dramatic thing. Also, that wasn't the reason you couldn't see me before. It was just funny. The oh, reveal well, was worth it. It was good. Welcome. Yeah, we're we're introducing ourselves and saying one thing we love about cyberpunk. Yeah, great because I was rebooting. Uh, I'm Paul Matievich. Um, my pronouns are he him. Uh, I like cyberpunk because I like weird sci-fi shit. What cool. is the weirdest sci-fi shit that you like though? Uh, um, whatever's going on in clip space. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here for that. Space, yeah. space, cyber, cyberspace. Yeah. Cool. Um, yes, cool. Okay, so that's all of us. Um, so, cyberpunk as a genre. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of contemporary mainstream cyberpunk favors 
style over substance. We've probably all seen this uh, after the rise of cyberpunk, the video game two years, two years, one year ago. I don't, it feels like forever ago that, um, you know, it's just when you Google cyberpunk now, that's all that comes up is that video game. Um, mm -hmm. But this is kind of a, a weird representation of the genre in itself and not, uh, not, not the genre in its entirety. Um, Contemporary cyberpunk, you know, the tropes tend to be neon, rain, style, emo characters, maybe some some naked ladies on giant billboards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, it lacks the context, the themes, and the meaning of cyberpunk that we love. So a lot of the problems you might see in mainstream cyberpunk include guns, military or cop porn, um, hot rich people being cool, uh, hot objectified, you know, feminine folks or techno orientalism or any other brand of racism. Um, but a lot of cyberpunk, you know, that goes back to kind of the beginnings of cyberpunk and marginalized cyberpunk, it actually focuses on things like high tech, low life. So like you're looking at subcultures and people who live kind of in marginalized identities, like queer, disabled, uh, diverse bodies, neon noir, um, you're looking at a capitalist dystopia, so you're talking about class inequity, um, you're looking at a lot of social critique, and of course, technology. So a lot of cyberpunk goes back to, well, cyberpunk originates with the, the holy trinity of Blade Runner, the movie, mm -hmm. Neuromancer, the book by William Gibson, and Akira, the manga, the Japanese manga. Um, and from those three kind of spawned all of these ideas about, you know, class inequity. And, and it was in the midst, you know, 80s global politics. So we had the Cold War. Um, we had a huge focus on technology, kind of the fear of rapidly, um, what's the word, progressing technology without kind of any moderation or control, um, mostly by rich eccentric people. Uh, and, you know, there's that famous quote from William Gibson, the future is here, but it's not evenly distributed yet. We have all the technology to do anything that we wanted to live the best lives that we can, but only this, the 1% gets to do that, right? So those are kind of the, the key, those are the key elements that we see in the cyberpunk genre. And there's millions of kind of like cyberpunk is like an umbrella term, right? And there's millions of subgenres under cyberpunk, um, which I won't get into, but Google some some subgenres and you will see a million of them. It's, they're pretty cool now. We have a lot of different types of cyberpunk today, aside from kind of like the 80s retro nostalgia that tends to be in the status quo mainstream. Um, and cyberpunk continues to be relevant. Uh, as we live in our hyper-capitalist class dystopia currently. Um, so that's kind of like an overview of cyberpunk. Uh, one other key thing to kind of think about is that marginalized creators have been making cyberpunk since its inception. Just <laughs> the right. Matrix. What? Yeah. <laughs> the Matrix, totally. Um, and I think that they're just rarely mentioned among the cis straight white creators. Um, so, you know, we've always been here. Um, we, all of us here create cyberpunk as well. So with kind of, kind of with that, in, that intro, kind of like thinking about those ideas going into, into this and into, into role-playing games, um, you know, there's kind of, there's a big difference between a lot of these ideas and what we see in especially kind of big tabletop role-playing games, like the big like, uh, you know, cyberpunk itself and Shadowrun and um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? I guess you've been Eclipse Face sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, so, cyberpunk Red? Cyberpunk Red, yeah, I guess that counts now. I haven't actually looked at that yet. <laughs> Me neither. I'm honestly making that choice based on the title of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else can speak on that because I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, totally. Like, let's get into that. Like, um, what do what does cyberpunk game tabletop games tend to do that 
kind of doesn't fit the genre or that does fit the genre. And we're, I think we're all kind of biased because we've all designed tabletop, <laughs> cyberpunk tabletop role-playing games. They're doing things that are different. So like, what are, what are some differences that you kind of see sometimes? I think people, when, when gamers think of cyberpunk, they think kind of of Shadowrun, I think. That's true, that's true. Shadowrun has like the biggest influence. And um, I think uh, the moment anyone talks about designing cyberpunk, especially among the marginalized, people like to say, have you heard of Shadowrun? Like it's not the biggest <laughs> like thing in the space. Uh, mm. But yeah, definitely Shadowrun is the thing that all our games are compared to uh, very often, right? I'd have to say. Yeah, absolutely. And it, Shadowrun is interesting too because it's kind of like D&D cyberpunk. It's like, um, you know, it's got the fantasy, it's fantasy sci-fi, which is fine and cool. Um, and there's some some cool things that Shadowrun does. Like it has like pretty cool um, uh, indigenous representation for its time, you know. Uh, it, it has some cool ideas about fighting, fighting corpse. But uh, a lot of it is is a little neoliberal in its uh, in its approach. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Now, I'm trying to think like how does cyberpunk kind of differ as a genre from what we a genre as we know? Um, I'm a big fan of the often indie tabletop games that I'm playing. We're always the small person. We're not that one percent who holds anything. We are the ones trying to fight to take them down, and I love it. I love ground up kind of instead of top down um kind of storytelling too and it just really informs on the kind of people that are on the ground suffering and i love that those are the stories that i want to be a part of because that's what speaks to me and that's what cyberpunk that's the grittiness of it not the glamour and glitz of it and i think there's something to be said too where we um so when we're looking at the genre as a whole a lot of the media that we see is this kind of it is tinged in this nihilism and this idea that like um whatever you do uh you're just a small person up against the whole system uh and uh, a lot of the media kind of delves very deep into that into that cycle or that concept of like uh, futile um, resistance. Like you can make a small change here, but it's never gonna, uh, it's never gonna change uh, this this capitalist dystopia that we're in. Um, with TTRPGs, we get into a very interesting space because um, you have uh, characters um, who are in some ways, you know, a player projection of themselves into that world, um, and most of the time, if uh, like people play TTRPGs to experience the story, but also to have feel like there's some effect of change uh, based on their interaction with uh, the game and the world. I don't think most people go into to tabletop RPGs to be like, unless this experience explicitly states it, to be like, I'm doing this and then nothing will happen, right? Nothing that I do matters. Uh, there are some games that do that really well, but they tend to be very clearly labeled, like nothing you do here will make a difference. Um, most of the time because of the the interactive nature of the games and also the um like and generally how TWG can function as a as a fantasized um you know way for us to to interact with the world uh, i feel like a lot of cyberpunk TWG specifically uh provide that avenue or or seek to provide that avenue for people to be those badass like individuals against the corporate one um, and uh, kind of give that uh, momentum uh, for uh, that type of story. Um, whereas, you know, the cyberpunk genre is generally as a whole, we, we tend to think of it as this very nihilistic thing, um, at least in terms of cyberpunk from the 1980s, uh, because that, that's what the genre was, is this idea of hopelessness and like, everything's going to be terrible uh, because we're projecting our fears about technology in the East uh, onto the world. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting to see how, like, most of the time we are playing, you know, the people who have to fight back against stuff in TTFPGs. Very often we're not, you know, pe playing people who are just like, well, everything's shitty and I'm here now um, and I'm just going to go about my world. Do, 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 do. Uh, that's not generally how it works. Yeah, that reminded me. There is kind of a lot of our uh, of despair in in some in some mainstream cyberpunk. I think 
um, where it's kind of just like, you're just, you're just trapped in this system and you just have to be a worker bee and this is just your life as opposed to like, no revolution, <laughs> you know? And I see a lot, I think I see a lot more revolution themes in um, a lot more like indie creations or marginalized creations. Yeah, because yeah, we need um, it, right? We need to have that hope. Sorry, you were saying, Eden. Uh, um, yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, a, a lot of um, mainstream cyberpunk stuff, especially with regards to games, it's very oh, how to put this. It's very obviously like inspired by Neuromancer in that you sort of work for the corporations, but not really, and you probably have like guns and every place you go to is the same fucking place. Sorry, this is like a specific thing that bugs me. Like every cyberpunk game has like, here is the bar. Here is the bar that sucks. Here is the bar that the PCs hang out. Here is yep. the bar of the GGA their Christian theme. Here is the gun shop. Here is the Asian place. Mm -hmm. All the exact same things in like every city in the world. Anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, but yeah. No, that's great. You forgot the strip club. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's right, that's right. The strip club where you pay extra for the real bodies. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and neon lights everywhere. <laughs> there, there's a tremendous amount of horrible, horribly portrayed sex work in cyberpunk where it's there could compelling. be right? it's Absolutely. like it's so compelling though, because obviously like your body is not necessarily yours. You might not own it. And so mm -hmm. like it's an awesome setup for great sex work stories. <laughs> And yet they do it terribly consistently. Like the like the conversation about bodily autonomy and how deep that could get. And like, especially for like female bodies. And yeah, they never take advantage of that. It's just like, oh, we own your body. Therefore you should sell yourself for sex to make it worth your while. Like there's so much more that we could do. And if that's going to be the angle that we take, why not make it something amazing? And so like at and I'm also just expressing my extreme displeasure at the poor handling of just sex workers in general or just sex as a co like as a concept in cyberpunk like i need that to be explored properly yeah, yeah and i think related to that is just this lack of intimacy in a lot of the traditional cyberpunk genre right like sort of like intimacy was seen as a downfall or was seen as something yeah. that could be used against you right and so i think that's why like currently i try to when i work on um, but like Bayan, which is a TTRPG that uses a belonging outside belonging system and draws upon Filipino folklore and post-colonialism. But that intimacy, that hope, that revolution is so important to me because these are just natural extensions because cyberpunk as a genre was naturally first like a cautionary tale, right? It was like, this is where we're headed. This is what we're afraid of. And this is the future that we're headed to. And nowadays I think cyberpunk as a genre has transformed because we are, it is undeniable how much how real that 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 future is now to all of us and so we no longer need a cautionary tale we need a tale of how are we going to take back this world right so how are we going to reclaim that hope and i think that's really just a natural and it's a place where marginalized creators naturally move towards because to us hope is all that we have right like the idea of nihilism is not is not an option for us, right? So, yeah, yes, absolutely. There's um, oh, what you said reminded me of something, and I just lost it. Yep, that's how your brain works. <laughs> you're doing well, and you're doing well. Some morning, you're doing good. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, what you said reminded me of um, kind of like cyberpunk queer theory that I've read. Um, there, there's like lots of um. Kind of dissections of you know the cyborg as metaphor for queer person for gender for trans etc um when when i was uh trying to find better pronouns for myself for a while i used cyborg as an identifier um you know and i think a lot of a lot of non-binary and trans people really cling to or like the idea of having a cyborg body for me it's kind of like i don't being able to switch out parts body parts so, yes. so cool it's like that is goals i want yeah. that right now in life you know yeah yeah, yeah so appealing. for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i mean you know and to be able to kind of imagine the hopeful version of that i think the 
like maybe the the queer power fantasy of that um, versus the you are owned by a corporation version of that um, is pretty cool. I I wrote a short game of, that's kind of a sad, <laughs> kind of a sad trans game, but um, uh, kind of that's about that called Body Hack, um, and it's a one player journaling game where you kind of go through the process of getting your new body parts. Um, and yeah, I just, I think it's such a fruitful, fruitful void to explore. It's kind of hard to do in, in role-playing games. I think a lot of it, um, in tabletop role-playing games, I think a lot of it is kind of very personal. I don't, it's, uh, I keep wanting to get into the body stuff in a tabletop role-playing game and being like, okay, here's all your, here's all your parts, I guess, in a list. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you I get one like extra die, yeah. yeah <laughs> so, like for each extra body part, yeah, yeah. And I, th I think um, a lot of early stuff that we saw in the genre and CTRPGs that I didn't like was the idea that the more machine you became, the less human and the less soul you had, right? And and so playing Shadowrun, I, I remember being so frustrated because I wanted to have those cool machine body parts. But I was playing a, a summoner, right, a troll summoner. And so that would like cut into, so there was this weird binary delineation, right, between magic and, and tech. And I was like, I, I, but I wanted, I wanna, what, why is it separated? So, so once again, like, but like Bine is really just like, but like Bine is like, Jamie really enjoyed Shadowrun, but Jamie had, wants to do, wants to, combine like magic and and tech and so that's also part of it but um actually i wanted to ask like kiana so so you have an amazing setting that you're working on with a partner right and so what made you decide to like create a setting uh, and really flesh it out versus like create a system to go along with it yeah yeah so um i am uh the co-author of archon uh with the city of neon daylight which is a uh, system agnostic setting uh, that I have created uh, with my uh, collaborative partner, uh, Jason Cutrone. Um, and so, yeah, we when we first were coming up with the idea, um, funny enough, uh, Archon started as a text RP setting just for the two of us to work with, because we were like, we want to do cyberpunk, like, uh, game stuff together, but like we don't really like how, this, how other systems deal with their stuff and how others a lot of the problems that I found when I was looking for cyberpunk stuff was that system and setting was super entwined with each other. So like you couldn't play, you know, a cyberpunk game, um, you know, you do, you know, cyberpunk red and like not have all the baggage of like, um, if you put on machine parts, you become less human. Um, mm -hmm. You are, you are now. So I was like, well, I, I don't want to play in that world. Like I would love to use these, mechanics that work really well and people clearly like uh but i was i kept butting up against this problem where it's like but in order to do that you have to accept all this ableist and racist stuff and i was like all right but what if i don't um so we created this setting just for the two of us really and then um we were like wait maybe other people would want this um so and and so we do have plans to make a, a a system that could work with the Archon setting, but we were mostly just focused on, you know, what would it look like to have this fully fleshed out world that other people could use and could use in whatever system they feel is appropriate for it. Um, just because like, we just wanted to provide that extra option. Um, so like you can play Cyberpunk, but more for, we, we like to think of it as reimagined for the, for the 21st century, so actually addressing a lot of the stuff we talked about, you know, uh, as a more hopeful, uh, as a more hopeful genre, um, getting rid of a lot of the uh, problematic baggage from the 1980s uh, rooted uh, cyberpunk uh, and really examining it from a modern lens. Um, because again, with any fiction, uh, especially speculative fiction, um, even though you're talking about the future, what you're really doing is you're talking about the present, uh, the present that it was created in. Um, that's that's just a, a truth among <laughs> any speculative fiction is that you are going to be, you can't imagine a future without basically you know, what is happening right now uh, in some way or another, whether that's going along with what's uh, happening in the future or like or going along with what's happening in the present or like being explicitly subversive, but either way you're rooted in the present day. Um, so yeah, so we were like, let's just create a whole setting. So we've created everything from like, what is the history of this place? What is the, um, what are the you know places? Not just all bars or strip clubs. We were very like, 
we did put in more cool places, um, putting in NPCs and hooks and all that stuff. Um, and a big part of it was uh, creating these five tenets for ourselves, uh, these five principles that we we went into creating the setting with. So we knew what we were going into, what everyone else would know going into the setting. Uh, and those are a lot of my own principles, both cyberpunk and the genre. Um, and yeah, so really it would just be was born from, hey, Cyberpunk is not just what we see in the mainstream and it doesn't, and in terms of CRPGs, it doesn't have to be, you can only play this particular cyberpunk genre with this particular game. Like we, we, uh, we found it important to be more open and to be more explicit about what a modern cyberpunk could look like. <laughs> so yeah. Long so answer. Cool, so cool. But... <laughs> no, excellent, excellent answer though. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds rad. I want to. I want to play all of these. I keep trying to rope people into games with me. Um, <laughs> uh, Etten, you also recently designed a cyberpunk game. Uh, that's yeah. I, I feel like Odd White Alec. Yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of focused on it seems like capitalism a bit. Uh, a little bit, kind of. Um, I I just I mean it's it was one hundred percent debuffing, but apart from that. Uh, Kind of this. I, it was mostly just um, a lot of other cyberpunk games don't let you play just a regular person, I guess. Like it's all, um, you know, guys with rocket launchers and uh, mole ninjas and that kind of thing. And I just wanted to be, play a game where you could, you could be like some guy just dealing with a regular life that just happens to have all of this cyberpunk stuff in it. Also, I put it in space because I like space. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to play, a, I just wanted to make it a game about um, how you would deal with this kind of thing. If, um, you know, maybe you can have a lot of cool skills, like you can be like a thief or you can be a cool hacker, but not necessarily like this jacked, I don't know, corporate warrior or whatever. You, you just, um you, Afterwards, you like to go to the coffee shop and or like sleep a lot and that kind of thing. Uh, apart from that, uh, yeah, um, the other thing is I am very bad at writing stuff that isn't comedy. Like if you've read Hardwired Island, you probably noticed um, there's like a bunch of footnotes about how there's no deer on the station for no reason. I just thought that was funny to write five times. And just, and then if you write about, if I feel like if you want to write stuff that's relevant to today, like a lot of stuff that happens today is just so silly. Like you write out what's actually happening and you say, no, that sounds like a joke. I'm not putting that in. So you do something else and it still kind of sounds like a joke, but you know, at least people will kind of take it seriously. So yeah, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. <laughs> It sounds a lot like uh, like keying into the absurdity, like absurd cyberpunk. Um, like it reminds me kind of of Cowboy Bebop's uh, tone. Oh yeah, I like Cowboy Bebop. Um, that was a big thing. Um, I just <laughs> I like how Cowboy Bebop, even the main characters who are like cool bounty hunters, are just like regular people who just like they goof off when they're not working. Um, they leave food in the fridge for too long and regret opening the fridge later. You know, all that kind of stuff. They deal with like real human problems. Yeah, yeah, real real people problems. I think, yeah, that's my favorite cyberpunk too. You know, your low low life, high tech low life, like low life being the everyday person, you know, maybe uh this person who's suffering maybe the most under capitalist, evil capitalist oppression. Um and kind of like the everyday cyberpunk. There was a show, oh we'll get to that later. We've got a good question. Um, which I think would be cool to tackle. How do you balance the hope of revolutionary fervor and imagination of possible futures in playing power cyberpunk versus grappling with the quiet hope and grappling with despair or burden of difficult cyberpunk? So kind of like power fantasy versus um, maybe dealing with intense themes. Yeah, yeah. Is it okay if I answer the question first, or please okay. do? Cool, cool, cool. So this is definitely something that was really important to me and came out naturally as I was uh, as I'm developing, but like by but it was there from the start. So you play 
as elementals, magical beings based on Filipino folklore that now their magic, they were enslaved by the corporation. And that is what is fueling the entire empire of the corporation all, all across the star system. It's called Balik Bayan because you're returning home, Balik to return Bayan, you know, country. And so uh, basically the thing is you are incredibly powerful beings. So you can at any point use your machine magic to do incredible things. So the Thik Balan can like shape shift into mythical creatures. Uh, the saint can speak to the little gods in the area and perform miracles, the Saint Thelmo can hack into ghosts because, you know, I mean, I wanted to hack and I like ghosts, so it made sense to put those two things together, right? You know, just totally normal. Um, but the thing is, with all of that power at the same time, when you create the world together, when you create the setting, there is an understanding that you left others behind, right? That you were able to escape, but you left several other elementals behind. And so a lot of the ones who are chasing you down are the ones that you left behind, right? Those who still work for the corp. And something that tends to happen in like almost every game of Balik Bayan that I've been in is that people really, really struggle with the past. Like several times it turns out one of the characters used to be part of the corp or is connected to the corp somehow. Like that tends to, that tends to come up. So a lot of these like dark themes come up naturally and a lot of Balik Bayan has its, it's my exploration of post-colonial themes as a Filipino designer, right? It's something that just naturally comes up and the core are our masters, right? But now we are trying to become our own masters. So there's definitely a power fantasy, like, but, but the bits and pieces that you have to choose from that you work with in the game also come from like that dark past, right? And so the game just naturally flows between those two things and I think because that is what makes hope stronger, right? When you're more aware of the dark that you come from, right? But yeah. <laughs> you were gonna say something, Eden, I think, or? Uh, no, I was just nodding. I mean, I can <laughs> say something. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, the question was like, how to balance these things, right? Uh, you know right? Yeah, kind of balancing hope of revolutionary yeah. fervor and power fantasy um, versus like the difficult so themes of cyberpunk. So, I mean, my answer is kind of the last thing I said, but usually when I do it, it's just um, like a bit of comedy, I guess. Just making it a little bit silly, like having to laugh at it. Um, the thing I didn't mention last time that's in Hardwired Island, but I didn't mention it because it's um, it sounds really bleak and that's because <laughs> it is, but bear with me here. Uh, so you know how in um, Cyberpunk, the game, there's that condition, what's it called, cyber psychosis? Yeah. Where for some reason um, becoming more, um, well, disabled with prosthetics makes you go around the twist for no reason. Uh, hardwired, hardwired Island's version is called cyber neurosis, and it's not an actual medical condition. It's something that was made up by a corporation uh, to get out of paying a settlement because from um, the first ever person to get cybernetic eyes uh, isn't around anymore for reasons and uh they didn't want to put they didn't want to have to pay a settlement to their family or anything so they just kind of made up this condition and they just keep talking about it in the media all the time and then uh later on players can get cyber um cybernet uh, cybernetics that have built-in advertising which wasn't written by me it was written by um alexander blackman who is amazing by the way but uh you can also get uh from like this sponsored cybernetic stuff that goes the money you spend on it goes into a fund that's being used to get that condition recognized as an official condition and that's really bleak but also holy kind cow of, <laughs> american self instruction is when i stub my toe comedy is when you fall in an open manhole and die that's uh-huh. <laughs> the darkest kind of comedy. No, absolutely. That's cool. I like your hyper like bureaucratic take like approach. Sometimes sometimes I get a little lost with cyberpunk bureaucracy, but it is one of my favorite things when it really gets down into the weeds of like all the nonsense that that like just really critiques I think our contemporary corporate bureaucracy. Yeah, I got like 
we did like pages of stuff on cybernetics and androids and their relation with labor. And I have no idea if anyone other than me thought it was interesting, to be honest. <laughs> but I liked it. Any other thoughts on this topic from uh, games people have played or, or how it kind of ties in with, uh, you know, TTRPGs? We can move on if not. Yeah, let's move on. Um, so we kind of talked about power fantasies. Oh, I, I briefly, I think it depends what your power fantasy is. Um, I think a lot of people in role playing games think power fantasy is like, yeah, I'm going to go punch someone in the face and we're going to solve problems. And, uh, you know, I'll feel like a hero, you know, very Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, which is a lot of mainstream cyberpunk. It's like, I've got big guns, we're going to have a gunfight. It's that scene in the Matrix when, you know, they, they go into the building with the trench coats, etc. But um, for me, power fantasy is like, how, how can I make this as sad as possible? And where's my found family? And, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of you know, when it comes to revolution, a small revolution, like creating community, um, kind of build, building, um, t taking the actions that you can to change things. I think, I think uh, in, in this type of cyberpunk we're talking about, that is like kind of a predominant way to approach that, like finding the beauty, the happiness, the hilarity, and kind of like the everyday cyberpunk life. Um, Carol and Tuesday, if you haven't seen it, is an anime um, that's on Netflix, I think. It's great. It's kind of like um, two people who are trying to form a band. So it's like music, cyberpunk, um, and they're on Mars. It's it's kind of just like everyday cyberpunk, um, which I think hits on some of the things that we're talking about pretty well. It's very hopeful. Um, so we talked about issues. I think we covered issues pretty well, actually. Um, uh, what we find interesting in cyberpunk we kind of went over with like the descriptions of our games. <laughs> um, is there any kind of cyberpunk, like what is some of your favorite stuff to, like when you think of different media that influences the games that you're creating um, or like the fa your favorite themes that you want to highlight in cyberpunk, what do you, what do you think is uh, some of the stuff that you think of the most or, or key, key media touchstones? that might not be as well known? Um, I mean, I have a key media touchstone. It's not that it's not well known, it's just that it's always done the exact same way, but my all time favorite is giant mecha robots that are trying to take down mega corporations or they're involved in the corporations. I watched a lot of Gundam growing up um, and that really takes the idea because like what is happening on the planets or on earth, it's just like these, um, one percenters are trying to oppress the people and there's always that one person that has that giant robot that can save the world and i live for that i live for those kind of stories i am playing in a tabletop game um iron Edder reforged uh by the other tracy tracy barnett and it very much takes that as a premise but it injects um good old-fashioned like norse mythology into it so i'm we're already dealing with the crap and uh, hell hole that we already have and it just I love I love a little bit of that flair I love because I can I can turn into a giant titan effectively um and I have dreams of being big and stomping on my enemies <laughs> that's a good dream it is I, I like to dream it is, big, it is. You know? it is <laughs> the mech draw the mech uh genre also kind of has that inherent like emo relationship drama baked into it too right absolutely it's hard to disassociate the two <laughs> good stuff anyone else like not as not as well known cyberpunk i know that ghost of the shell the original film is very well known but my favorite is actually the standalone complex series I think it's Me too. really, it's so good. Every time I hear that opening song, I like, I go into a different headspace, right? It's so good. Um, so despite the fact that section nine mm, has its mm, issues, um, I think overall Standalone Complex as a series delves into so many different great cyberpunk themes in this really subtle way that I really enjoy. And I think this ongoing, like it really explores what does it mean, like the ghost of the machine, right? Like that nature of the soul, uh, because the main character, most of 
their self has been replaced by machine parts, right? And so there's this constant question of like, who am I really like outside of my job and what do I really desire? And, you know, um, I think it's really, really good stuff. My favorite episode has to be the one, ah, oh, just thinking about it makes me cry. It's one of the early episodes in San Alon Complex when the tank, so there's a, there's a person who, uh, right? Like Kira knows what I'm talking about already. So there's a person who gets sick, is unable to, you know, they, they pass on, but they are able to transfer their brain, I'm getting emotional, uh, to, to a tank, right? And so I don't want to spoil what goes on in the episode. You have to watch it. So at first you think, this is just an episode about stopping the tank. It must be about vengeance, but no, it's about something else. And it's so sad. It's so good. So um, it's one of my, and, and I, I just really love how anime as a whole has like taken the cyberpunk genre that was like so focused on tearing down the East and like focusing on tropes of Orientalism. But I really feel like anime, when it delves into cyberpunk has, has really made it their own, right? And added their own take on it that I really, really love. So my vision of cyberpunk is really more anime influenced because of it. But yeah, I also watch way too much anime because I, I went on no one of I went on these shows and I, I watched I watched nine hours of anime straight before the pen. Before Damn. seeing B. You did I your homework. In like Acura flashbacks, but uh, anyway, no, but it's really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. But yeah. Yeah, Ghost in the Shell. Oh my god, it's my favorite thing in the world. It's the first time I like saw a character. I was like, that's me. Um, I feel like I'm being represented on screen. Um, like just a, kind of in a gender, in a gender way. Um, and, uh, gosh, that episode you're talking about with the tank is so good. Oh so my God. Good. It's, there's so many heartbreaking episodes and it's not, essentially, I mean, there's, there's some cop issues with ghosts in the shell standalone complex that like technically they're cops, but yeah. it does get into the fact that they discover, um, corruption inside the bureau and they start, yeah. uh, dissecting that and taking that down. Um, so it's hit or miss, <laughs> but, but you know, at least they kind of address, uh, it's kind of one of those Japanese things. It's like, did you know we have bureaucracy problems? Um, no. you know, like, like Shin Godzilla and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And, and cyberpunk anime is so much good stuff. Lame is another good classic. Um, you know, Cowboy Bebop, which is getting remade, of course. Uh, I just started rewatching it and it's even better than I remember. Yeah, I watched the whole thing for the first time last year. I mean, my partner did because we'd never seen the whole thing. It's all about that mushroom episode. And yeah, I'm, mushroom I'm, episode. Cur I'm currently watching it with my partner right now um, oh, I because that. I have never. And every single person I talk to is like, how have you not watched this? This is can of yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm like, but there's so much stuff to you, watch. You, know? you, didn't, you didn't tell me that there'd be a non-binary gremlin and a very True. smart dog in it. True. You know, that, that should have been the hook. Those are the selling points, yeah. <laughs> Non-binary gremlin is the non perfect description. <laughs> um, Kiana, do you have uh, do you have any kind of genre it's, like it's, touchstones that are inspiration for you? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so my my touchstone into the genre was Blade Runner, like one of my favorite movies. I've one of my dad's favorite movies so we've watched like every single cut and ending and all that stuff um and i started that pretty young um but when i went into school and university i started developing more of the the critical knowledge and a lot of the um academic focus on on cyberpunk as a genre uh so a lot of my a lot of my my own background and touchstones actually come from a lot of those philosophical thinkings about you know what it is to be human and what it is to be um to be uh you know a person in a society um so looking at a lot of the ethics stuff which is kind of a weird thing to to bring into ttrpgs but i i my my sub focus in in university was uh with ai ethics or tech ethics specifically um so uh so yeah i don't have like specific like media and i would have to go looking into all of my academic papers to figure <laughs> out which ones i uh but I, I i mostly look at a look at it from a philosophy cogsci um and you know ethics viewpoint and uh and that i think is a valuable lens to look at cyberpunk as a genre because cyberpunk is you know in a, in a capitalist dystopia it's all about the violation of those ethics and then what does it mean to do good in in a terrible world 
uh, what does it mean to do good by you, by the community, by other people, um, and all that stuff. So, yeah, unusual answer, uh, mostly because my other media touchstones have been touched upon already. So oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. I have loved, I have like several of those like um, essay compilation uh, books on like, you know, one's called like machine sex and another one is like, you know, feminism robots or something. I don't know, just like where it's a collection of academic papers on this stuff. They're super cool. A lot of them are dated. Like a lot of them are from the 90s, but, uh, you, you know, kind of like you can see the transformation of like how people thought about it then versus how we're beginning to think about it now that we're all, you know, like cyborgs um, every day. Um, and do you have any any last minute genre thoughts? We've only got five minutes. Uh, okay, well, real quick, like I was just going to say anime, lots of, lots of anime. Um, apart from that, I guess I'd mention Eclipse Phase again. That's one of mine. It's... A bit more like transhuman horror, but I usually play it as very cyberpunk. Uh, I just like it because, again, it's sort of about normal people, although it's um, the premise is it's a post scarcity world and you can live in space and change your body for like a fucking orangutan if you want. So it's more about like the kind of bullshit that normal people get up to if you let them do that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll keep it short. That's my thing. <laughs> that was so good, though. It's like, this is what I want. This is what I like. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want to be a monkey with a knife. Yeah. Yes. We all have yeah. goals. I want to be a giant robot, you know? <laughs> a plus. Ooh. I want to be a lesbian cyborg. Yeah. 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 I, want to, I want to rebuild myself like Acura, right? Ooh. From nothing and just... Whoa. Sorry. So anyway, that's my real Deep. self showing through for a moment. <laughs> Akira is, is so it's talking about cyberpunk and horror is interesting. That's kind of like a crossover point. Um, okay, I think we're out of time. So let's do quick outros. Um, I, I'm Kira McGran. You can find me mostly on Twitter at Kira Serpentine, um, posting pictures of my snakes and wildlife and talking about games occasionally. Um, uh, Jamie, would you like to go next? Yeah, so once again, Jamie, he they pronouns. You can find me on Twitter at Tempro Hiccup. And you can find me on itch.io at temporahiccup.itch.io. If you'd like to support me, I continue to work on Blink Buy, which is going in interesting places. Please check out patreon.com slash games. I post the latest updates and versions of Blink Buy in there. So I'd love to see you. <laughs> Hello, uh, I am B Zelda. I am a podcaster. Um, gosh, I do a bunch ton of podcasts. Honestly, follow me on Twitter to figure out what I do. You can find me as at B underscore Zelda. I don't know if I could say that I've contributed to Archon. Yes, you can. So, yes! You are. <laughs> <laughs> Which was so much fun because that setting is incredible. Um, I'm participating or I'm playing and streaming and podcasting in so many cyberpunk settings. I just want to immerse myself in this so I can eventually live out my dreams of becoming a, I don't know, 50 foot tall robot. That's not too high. I think that's, I'm, I'm giving general <laughs> kind estimates for how tall I want to be. <laughs> reasonable goals. Yes. Very reasonable. Um, yeah, I'm Kiana. You can find me over on Twitter at Kiana S. Um, best way to figure out what I'm doing. Um, if you want to learn more about Archon, uh, which is, again, this uh, new cyberpunk setting that's system agnostic, uh, created by me and Jason Catone, and has awesome expansion writers like B, uh, but also uh, Amaraz, and also uh, Sailor Scout Austin, uh, you can go check that out over at kianas.itch.io. And we are working very hard on getting version 2.0 out um, in partnership uh, with Metal Weave Games. So uh, you, you'll be able to get the PDF and a print run of uh, the expansion. So basically it has the, the setting as we have it now, but also all of the content from our expansion writers, plus our own expansion, plus new NPCs and art and maps. And it's great. Uh, I'm very excited to have that for you uh, at the beginning of, uh, of next year so yeah so go check that out and you can go follow more updates over on both twitter and on itch <laughs> yeah, um is it me yep okay uh i'm etten you can find me on twitter at etten64 um hardwired island is coming out in print soon you can get it in pdf um i also made breakfast cult and odang bigfoot stormer carl with my best friend's birthday present inside uh i make very good posts 
Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, the best goodbye. <laughs> yes, go, yes. Go, go. Woo! <laughs>